what a what a joy it is to be with y'all today. I am so excited about what God has planned for each of us. My name is Amberly Neese, and I am a speaker and a comedian and, a, and an author and a mom and a wife and a worker bee. Um, but the most important thing that I want you to know about me is that I am a child of the King. I'm a child of God, and I am so excited about what He is going to teach us as we dive into His Word. I hope this week has been fantastic as we have been studying, but I want to kind of focus down on a couple of things, and I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with a visual. So this little doodad, um, which is the, that's the biblical term for it, is a doodad. Um, <laughs> but this little doodad, does anybody know what this is? The white thing, yes. Connector, yes. Adapter, yes. Okay, but there's a term for this. My friend Krista taught me the term because I'm not very hip on the, you know, uh, the talk. Uh, she told me that this is called a dongle, right? <laughs> Which is a stupid word. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like something you take medication for, you know, right? I have a terrible case of the dongles, and so just a little cream, and I'm good. So, uh, <laughs> so this is a dongle. But what does it do? Actually, a couple of, uh, of you said it, but I think it's so brilliant. If you, if you know what a dongle is, you probably have an Apple product. It is a connector of sorts. So if you have an old school phone like I do, um, I need one of these to connect to newer technology, and that's what this is designed for. But I would like to propose that you and I, we are dongles, <laughs> right? You and I are dongles. And I know you woke up this morning and said, I'm going to be a dongle for Jesus today, right? <laughs> I see you. Uh, But this is what, so the dongle connects my phone to your phones or however that works. But you and I are also connectors. See, we not only uh, connect to God and connect to other people, which is how we find our tribe and learn to thrive, but also we then have the opportunity in so many cases to, to connect people with the living God which is such an honor. I don't know about you, that is so exciting to me and so humbling to me that on some level, I am called by God when I look into his word to be a dongle for him, to be a connector, (laughs) right? It's not actually like in the scriptures. (laughs) Thou shalt be a dongle, amen, right? So, So how do we do this? What does this look like? How do we become connectors? Well, there's a ton of of opportunities for us to see it. In fact, in the New Testament alone, the term one another is used 52 times, depending on the version you're looking at. 52, one for each week of our year. These one another's, these, these glimpses of how God wants us to connect not only to him, but to one another. And again, to connect other people with him. So, so I started doing the research and I'm going to tell y'all the study has been so encouraging for me, you know, Uh, so such a blessing. And, and some verses, when you read them there, it's like a Hallmark card from Jesus, right? It's just so encouraging, right? You just think like, oh, thank you. That's so sweet, right? (laughs) And then there's some that just feel like, oh, sucker punch, right? And for me, That's what the verse that we're going to look at today, that's what it is for me. So if you would, please turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. I know some of you all already have it memorized. God bless you in your ministry. That's great. If you don't, you can follow along with me. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10 from the ESV version says this, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So I'm going to unpack this to the best of my ability, and I'm going to keep it simple, right? I wish I could say I keep it simple because I'm clever and I like alliteration, which I do, but that's not why I keep it simple. I keep it simple because I am stupid. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and I I don't mean that and mean to myself. The truth is I used to be brilliant. I used to be smart. I used to use big words with lots of syllables. It was, it was awe-inspiring, really. How smart it was. <laughs> but then I had children. And now I am dumb as a stick, okay? And I don't blame my kids. I mean, they're brilliant. I do love them. I think they're fantastic and they're worth it all. But I have a theory on how this whole thing happened, right? I'm not a medical professional, but I have a medical theory. This is how it goes. The pediatricians that I came in contact with called breast milk brain food 
So I think that I literally donated my brains to my children. I thought, right? Because they're super smart and I can't complete a sentence without tons of hand motions. You know, I'll say, I left it in the thing with the, the, the beep beep thing, you know, that thing. And they're like, the car? And I'm like, yeah, the car. You guys are so smart. You're welcome. Right? <laughs> way it works. So we're going to keep things simple today. We're going to unpack this verse in, in simple ways. It's the, the H's of this particular verse. So let's, let's start with the first one. The first one is honesty. If we're, we're going to unpack the keys to finding one another, we'll start with these four H's. And that first H is honesty. It says, love must be genuine. I think we've all come in contact with people that say they love us, but it's not genuine. And this verse tells us that we are to be people who love genuinely, love completely. When my husband and I were uh, looking for the diamond for my wedding band, um, he did a beautiful job of getting a great uh, engagement ring for me. But when we were looking for the diamond for, for the actual wedding day, we went to a jeweler and the jeweler, we were looking at all sorts of cases. We were looking at all of them. And I found myself continuing to go back to this one particular case I wish I could say it was because they were the shiniest or prettiest. It's because they were the ones in our price range. I'll be really honest with you, right? And I kept looking and I, and I said like, what about this one? What about this one? And the guy says, well, actually, those aren't diamonds. Those are, those are cubic zirconia. Those aren't real. And I said, oh, but they look so real. And he says, I totally understand. He says, do you know how we tell the difference between the ones that are real and the ones that are not? I said, I don't. I'm thinking to myself, well, I can tell the difference because the price tag is... Like there's lots more zeros in some of these other cases than what I'm looking at. And he said, no, uh, diamonds are actually their value, their greatest value is their flaws. That's how we can tell that they're not fabricated in some laboratory. That's what makes them real. And I thought, man, that preaches. When we think about loving other people, we need to recognize, we need to not only love the fact that uh, that they are flawed, right? And love them where they're at, but also recognize that we too are flawed. And all we can do is love people to the best of our ability to genuinely give them who we are, right? Not some like, this is my social media persona, right? But truly who I am to love people and their flaws. We all have issues to our tissues, right? We're all flawed. And so when we say love must be genuine, it's not this fabricated fake like persona of love. It is truly loving people where they're at. When, um, when the Acts 2 church was happening, now, people talk about the Acts 2 church all the time, but it's essentially the first church, right? After Jesus died, this was the first church that came together and they were revolutionary in the way that they loved each other. They, it was unbelievable. Uh, one of my favorite preachers, Andy Stanley says about the Acts, uh, Acts 2 church, he said, the primary activity of the church was one anothering one another. That's what they did. It was, it was huge. And I'll be honest with you, it was not unlike anything they'd ever seen in history. When we look at the Acts 2 church, they had people from all different backgrounds, all different cultures who came together and did life together. They one anothered one another so well. And my question is to myself, do I one another well? Do I love people where they're at? Do I genuinely care about them despite their flaws, despite my flaws, right? Community in Christ is not about like some kumbaya thing. It's about come on in. It's about being willing to open your life up, your heart up, your flaws up, and to love people well. So that's the first H. The first H is honesty. The second H is hold on right? The verse says, hold fast to what is good. I love, I love the idea of that verse, uh, of, that, of that verb, hold fast, right? So my mom's kind of no nonsense, right? She's kind of a no nonsense mom. And I remember when I would be especially, I don't know, teenager E, I guess, when I was especially <laughs> teenager E, she would say, get a grip, right? <laughs> get a grip. And because she had a Southern accent, it sounded even, you know, more awesome. So get a grip. But I remember thinking, what exactly am I gripping onto? Right? <laughs> like what exactly? It's one of those many things as parents, when you look back, you're like, maybe that was not my most shining moment, right? When I said that thing. So she'd say, get a grip all the time. And I knew what it meant. It meant that I needed to hold on to 
whatever it is, my emotions or my frustrations, I needed to hold on to that. This also says get a grip in the new, 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 new international version, but it says <laughs> hold fast to what is good. So what is good? What is good? Well, obviously God is good. But if he's called us into community, if he's called us into finding a tribe and learning to thrive, then good is also holding on to the opportunity to love people well and to hold on to the fact that even though community is difficult, and y'all, here's the deal, we are all a mess, right? That's why we need a mess, Saya, right? <laughs> right? So if we're going to hold on, if we're going to hold on to what is good, we, we need to recognize that community will be difficult. But the challenge, the, 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 the grit of it all is so good, not only for us, but for the people that we come in contact with who are becoming part of our tribe. So um, I am, at, I, if there was a 12-step program for people who killed plants, I would lead all of the meetings. Like I am, <laughs> I am the worst ever. It's such a struggle for me. I want to love plants, so I love them really hard by putting way too much water in them or not enough sun, but I kill everything. Would people bring plants to my house as a thank you or whatever? I find myself saying, like, you understand I'm going to kill this. Like, I feel like all the house plants in the house are like, run, run while you do it. <laughs> but recently, a woman in our church gave me two tomato plants. And I said, Beth, I'm going to kill these. I'll kill them. And she said, no, you won't. I trust you. I think you're going to be great. And so I determined that I was going to be the best tomato plant mother ever <laughs> in the history of ever, right? Like, I was going to nail this. And that's what I've been doing. I have watered and loved and done whatever. But somebody in my life said, well, do you have tomato cages for your tomatoes? I said, tomato cages? What's a tomato cage? She said, well, you know, those little metal, it almost looks like a teepee, those little cages. I said, no. I said, well, in, in nature, there's not like, you know, gophers and squirrels don't bring a tomato cage, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking we're going to be good. And she says, no, no, tomato cages, when, when those plants have that kind of structure, they grow better, and they, they're more fruitful. So I'm like, well, I will do anything since I'm the best tomato plant mother ever, right? I'm going to get these cages. And I'll tell y'all, when you get to my house, you have to step over. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I kind of nailed it. Like, I'm killing it. <laughs> but you have to step over the plants. There's so, and I, tons of tomatoes. Like, it's been such a gift to grow those things. But here's the deal. That tomato plant idea with the cages is just like the structure of getting in community. What does it do? It makes us grow more and we're more fruitful. And I don't know about you, but I want a piece of that. I think that is awesome. So when we talk about community, community in Christ is not just like opening one's calendar. It's about opening one's heart, right? So we're not only honest, but we're also holding on to what is good. The next H, some of you are gonna break into a sweat when I say this, but the next H is hug. Oh yeah. It says love one another with brotherly affection. Now I'm a hugger. It is a full body commitment when I hug somebody, right? It's not just like, oh, you're so cute. Mm, right? It's like, come on, come to mama. Right? <laughs> and then when I'm married into my husband's family, like I love my in-laws. I think they are amazing. But my mother-in-law, although she was hugging to the best of her ability, she's a patter. Do you know what a patter is? <laughs> like, oh, I just love you so much. I just want to eat you up, right? But I was like, what's with the back massage, right? I'm like, come on, give me a hug, right? It's not, you know, if you don't have, it's crazy. So that's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about if we're going to love one another with brotherly affection, think about the idea of a hug. What you're doing is you're allowing somebody into your space and you're saying this is safe, right? And that's what we do in biblical community. We're a, a safe place for one another. The, the Greek word for brotherly affection is philostorgos, right? Which I know you're like, yeah, I knew that. Maybe you did, I did not. But the root word of that is the same like philo, which is like brotherly love, right? I love the word philo. Like it's like, first of all, it reminds me of philo dough, so bring it on, right? <laughs> but it's like, you know, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia cream cheese is just... It's just like beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, right? <laughs> but 
true brotherly affection is also such a beautiful thing. So when we think about that, when we think of that brotherly love, think about it. I I don't know if any of you have had siblings. I have a, a sister that I love, but there were times when we were young we wanted to sell each other on eBay, right? <laughs> it was really hard. So brotherly love doesn't just look like, oh, everything's wonderful and roses and happy and, and bunny rabbits, right? Siblings can have tension. Siblings can have differences in opinion. Siblings can, there's all sorts of things. When my kids were little and they would be having tension, I would make them apologize to each other. And it was hilarious, actually. Because I'd say, come on, you guys, say sorry to each other. And both would go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, thanks. That's an Oscar-winning performance there, sir. Thank you so much, right? But community is, I'm sorry. When When you're wrong, you say you're sorry, right? And you draw people into what that looks like. So finding one's tribe includes also praying for and loving. Again, that's part of the bringing in people in that God has placed in our path. So in Matthew chapter five, Verses 44 and 45. Jesus charges us to pray for one another. You're like, well, what does that have to do? He goes deeper and says, pray for your enemies. I'm like, oh, no, I, I get to pray for one another, but pray for my enemies? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lot, right? But here's the deal. What I found, even though I've been in Christ for a long time, oftentimes I'm praying for my enemies to be more like me to look more like me and vote more like me and and think more like me, right? (laughs) Right? That's not what this says. If we're gonna pray for our enemies, we should be more focused on praying that God would make us more like him instead of making our enemies more like us. So enemies in our community, well, yeah, we're supposed to love one another. In fact, even in Psalm 23, one of my favorite pieces of scripture, that whole chapter is just so delicious. When he says, God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. So we're supposed to include community and people we do not agree with. So we are to be honest, we are to hold on and we're to hug, right? The next part is that we are to honor. The last part is we are to honor. It says, um, outdo one another in showing honor. I love outdo, I love that word, right? Because I'm a little competitive, I'll be really honest with you. So I love the, the part of my gym that has the little like circuit thing, right? With all the different weights and the do whatever. I love it because it, to me, it is like this smackdown. It is like this <laughs> awesome opportunity for, nobody knows, but I, I will always try to outdo the person that went before me. So if their, their weight thing is stuck on 15, then I'm, I'm cranking it up to 25. Or if it's on 75, I'm going up to 85 or whatever it happens to be. <laughs> yeah, I know. Aren't you like, wow, she's a great little church lady, isn't she? She's just, that's all she can think about. But yeah, that's totally me. So I take great pleasure. Like, again, nobody knows, but I just like, oh, I'm going to move this. And I may not be able to walk for three days, but by golly, I won't take them down, right? It feels so great. Periodically, however, God does humble me and he sends some like totally ripped dude in front of me. And I just wait for an old lady to go ahead and then then I start the thing. But if we are going to honor one another, it says outdo one another, which seems like counterintuitive outdo to show honor. It sounds like uh, just competition to do something of service. But I unpacked this with my pastor and I said, can you help me with this? I'm, I'm really struggling. What does this look like? And he gave me this great um, insight. He said, well, let's look at Luke chapter 14, verses seven to 11. It's Jesus telling this story about coming into a situation where all of the good seats were taken right? All of the good seats were taken. And he is rebuking these people. Like you didn't even think through, you were so worried about your own agenda, your own self-importance. You didn't think about anybody else. And here's the deal. The deal is Jesus could say, I'm the, I'm the son of God. I probably should, no, I definitely should be right there at the front of the, at the table, but that's not what he says, right? He just says, I need you to think about others. I need you to Think about something other than your own stuff, right? And for me, that was so huge. I want to be a person that outdoes people in showing honor, not because it's a competition, because that's what community looks like. Where I say, I would like for you to go first. I would like to serve. This would be a blessing to me. So those are the four H's, those four keys to biblical community. 
So this week, our theme has been finding our tribe by understanding friendship through the lens of biblical community. When we're in true friendship with someone else, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. But friendship is not without its challenges. In the word of God, we are commanded to, among other things, to do things like be devoted to one another, to honor one another, to stop passing judgment on one another. Ouch. To honor one another, uh, to encourage one another, to build one another up and spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Those are huge charges, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And when he calls us to do something, he will give us the opportunity to do so. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to dive into your word and to get a glimpse of just how awesome you are and how great your love is for us. Father, we thank you for biblical community. Whether we've found it yet or not, God, I thank you for your call on each of us to be a connector. And we praise you, Father, for your son who came to be the ultimate connector of all your people to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In a world where internet is judged by the speed of connection, we find ourselves, even those of us in the body of Christ, feeling disconnected from others. As E.M. Forrester said in his book, Howard's End, only connect, live in fragments no longer. And that's what disconnection feels like. It feels like we're in fragments. Our lives, our stories, our relationship with others, even how we view ourselves feels fragmented when we're not in biblical community. In this first week of our study, we've unpacked the idea of finding one another, which is the first step in the belonging project. My encouragement to you is to remember that developing your tribe is not an overnight process, but it's so worth it. As we continue to explore the one another's in the Bible, we'll gain more wisdom for cultivating a community in which we can thrive, be vulnerable, and encourage others in the process. Here's a belonging project challenge for all of us. As we began to find our tribe, let's follow Jesus' example by loving one another and showing one another honor.